Welcome to Heed the Word, the online Bible ministry of Calvary Chapel Southwest Metro in Joshua, Texas. Join us for this week's message in Ephesians chapter 5, titled, Love and Respect. As we start today, I want to I want to share a little joke with you, a little riddle, I guess you could say. Um, I, one of my favorite Bible teachers, Pastor David Rosales from Chino Valley, he shared this. Any of you have listened to David Rosales? Love David. And uh, so if you don't like this joke, you can blame David, but... <clears throat> It seems there was a perfect woman and she wanted to have the perfect marriage and so she met the perfect man. And this perfect man and this perfect woman had the perfect first encounter. They had the perfect first date. Over time, they discovered that they were experiencing the perfect courtship which led to the perfect engagement. They had the perfect wedding and the perfect reception that was the beginning of the perfect marriage. Well, one day this perfect couple was driving down the road when all of a sudden the weather took a turn for the worst and a terrible snowstorm struck. It just happened to be Christmas Eve and as they were driving down a treacherous mountain road, they, they saw a man standing beside the road wearing a red suit with a large bag. They stopped by this bearded individual and discovered, much to their surprise, that it was Santa Claus. His sleigh had broken down and he needed a ride. They thought to themselves, well, you know what? We want our families and our friends to have the perfect Christmas. And if Santa Claus can't deliver these toys, that's not going to happen. So we need to step up and help him. So Santa climbed into the car, loaded his bag in the trunk, and off they went delivering toys to all of the children in the world. But as they were driving and the conditions continued to get worse, they came to a treacherous intersection and were in a terrible automobile accident. Unfortunately, two of the three in the car that day died. Only one survived. Do you know which one it was? No, it was the perfect woman. You know how we know that it was the perfect woman that survived? Because neither a perfect man nor Santa Claus actually exist. (laughs) That also means, however, that the perfect woman was the one who was driving the car, which explains why they had the wreck in the first place. (laughs) You thought I was on your side there for a second, didn't you? Oh, my goodness. Don't blame me. Blame David Rosales. So I I begin that way just to say that the subject that we're talking about today can be kind of like that story. You know, we, we all want perfection in our lives. We, we want the perfect husband or the perfect wife or the perfect kids. And, and when we don't have those things, when we encounter the imperfections that inherently exist in each and every one of us, the recognition of the fact that the person that you're married to isn't perfect is almost as shocking as the realization that you are not perfect either. You see, we all have this expectation of how our husband or our wife is going to behave, how they're going to treat us, what kind of character they're going to have. And we have this goal, this desire for that perfection. But here's the problem. Perfection and reality are not the same thing, are they? Reality is usually somewhere down here. And as I've often said, the disparity between expectation and reality can be measured in what? Disappointment. So I want to help you avoid some disappointment today by helping you to recognize that if you're married, that man you're sitting next to, ladies, he's not perfect. I don't need to tell you that. You've already discovered it. But likewise, men, the lady that you're sitting next to, she is not perfect either. And none of us are perfect. And yet Christ has called us to be, hasn't he? He said, your father in heaven is perfect. So you be perfect too. You see, perfection is the standard, perfection is the goal, but until we stand before him in his presence, we're not going to get there. But it is something that we're continually striving for. We always want to be better. 
So it's a question not of destination, but rather direction. Which direction are you headed in? Are you becoming a better husband? Are you becoming a better wife? Are you becoming a better parent? Are you becoming a better child? Are you becoming a better employer? Are you becoming a better employee? What is the direction of your life? And are you moving in the direction in which God has called you to move? And we've been studying through the book of Ephesians, and, and you're familiar with where we've been, right? You, you should be. I've repeated it often enough. You know, there's always a desire that I have to, rather than starting right where we are, take a few steps back to reiterate what we've already said. Why? Because I know that some of you missed the week before, and maybe the week before, or, you know, or, or that maybe you forgot from one moment to the next. And so, you know, there's this desire to repeat what's already been said, but Every time I do that, it seems like I'm going back to the very beginning. So I'm just going to repeat a couple of things, okay? First of all, Paul writes in those first three chapters of Ephesians that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Amen? Every spiritual blessing. And we could enumerate those, but if you want a list of them, just go back and read through the first three chapters of Ephesians on your own. He has blessed us with so much. And because of that blessing, we are called to conduct ourselves in a particular way. We're to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called. In other words, if I have received the benefit of every spiritual blessing, then I want to live my life in a spiritual way, keeping my eyes on that which is above and not on that which is beneath, putting off the old man and putting on the new. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul wrote, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering. What does that mean? With all humility, with all gentleness, and with all patience. So those characteristics, humility, gentleness, patience, these are to be the characteristics of our lives as believers. Why? Because God has blessed us with the resources that we need in order to walk in this way. And then he goes on from there to explain what that looks like. And the culmination of these exhortations is found in chapter 5, verse 21, in which he says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. I don't like picking up in the middle of a sentence, so for the sake of context, I'm going to go back up to verse 15. Ephesians 5, 15, Paul writes, See then, that is in light of all of these blessings, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So we are to walk circumspectly. What does that mean? Well, to, 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 to circumspect or to be circumspect is to be aware of your surroundings. It, it's to pay attention to what is going on around you. You remember uh, that I think it was Magellan was the first one to circumnavigate the world, to sail all the way around the world? Well, to be circumspect is to look all the way around you, to inspect that which surrounds you, to be aware of how you walk. So in other words, we are to continually be going through a process in our lives as believers of self-evaluation. To, to examine your own heart and to say, Lord, is there anything in me that you want to change? Is there anything about the way that I am conducting my life that needs to come into greater alignment with Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, who is the chief cornerstone? 
And our desire as believers, our desire as those who have been redeemed, who have been made co-heirs with Christ, who have been invited to be members of the household of God, who are parts of the body of Christ that are being built by God into a holy temple for his spirit, we are to be in alignment with Jesus. In other words, he is the pattern, he is the standard, he is the example that we're to follow. And so what we do is we look at him and then we look at our lives. And if there's something that doesn't line up, he isn't going to change. Our lives are what need to change to align with him. Amen? So this goes on down here. In, 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 in chapter 5, verse 21, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Listen, we have a tendency to put off tomorrow to tomorrow what we really ought to be doing today. How many of y'all have a tendency to procrastinate? Okay? I, I, I used to run a Chick-fil-A in New Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and one of the things that I was responsible for during that tenure in that position was to make sure that all of our equipment was maintained in an appropriate way. And every once in a while, we would have one of our freezers that would have the compressor go out. Now, you know what happens when the compressor goes out on a freezer, right? It stops freezing. It's not cold anymore. And I'd have a refrigerator full of chicken. I mean, lots and lots of chicken. And so what I needed was for that refrigerator to start working as quickly as possible. Because yes, I had other freezers, but there wasn't room for everything in them. And so what I would do is I'd call up the repair technician, be like 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock maybe, and I'd say, hey, listen, I've got a compressor down. I need somebody to get out here to fix this right away. And what I would hear was like, well, you know, we'll, we'll be out tomorrow to take care of that. I'm like, tomorrow? I need it today. Well, tomorrow's the soonest that we can get there. All right, fine. Get here as soon as you can. So they'd get out there tomorrow. And then they'd go look at it and they'd say, well, your compressor's bad. We're going to need to order a new part. We'll do that tomorrow. And then, you know, they'd get the part ordered. And then, so when's that part going to be in? Well, it's not going to be in until tomorrow. You see, it's tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. It was what I came to call the manana attitude. And I have to confess that I am sometimes guilty of having a manana attitude myself. I'm going to go on a diet. When am I going to go on the diet? Tomorrow, right? Manana. Well, this idea of putting it off, of, of, of delaying it, it, is part of our problem because, you see, we are to redeem the time. We're, we're to look at, at the days and recognize how evil the days are, and as a result, we are to redeem that time, to take that time back, to win it back. You want to be convicted in your life? Ask yourself how you're using your time. How are you using your time? These days, you know, we've got, we've got the opportunity to waste more time than any generation before us, don't we? You know, when I was a kid growing up, people used to waste a lot of time watching TV. How many of you know people that used to waste a lot? Of, and boy, there was this thing that they called, it was called must-watch TV. You remember must-watch TV? And they'd have a Friday night lineup, and man, they'd have this great show and this great show and this great show, and the networks were working hard to win your viewership, and they'd keep you sitting there on that couch for several hours because... Each program, one after the next after the next, it was better than the one before. How many of you remember things like that? Was there, do, how many of you remember that there was a day during your week at some point in your life where you had to be home because all of your favorite shows were on that night? Let's be honest. Yeah? For me, it was Thursday night. I had to watch Doogie Hauser. I liked Doogie. Doogie was great. So... So, you know, there are, those, there are those moments in time when we look back on it and we say, wow, I remember what that was like. You know, that's not really like that anymore, is it? 
Because today we have things like DVRs. You know, DVRs are funny things. Yeah, I remember a, a, a while back I was, uh, I, I was uh, listening to the radio and I was listening to the BBC broadcast of the news and, and uh, I was listening to a, a report and they were talking about how, how uh, Cameroon had won against another country that was a big rival of theirs in, in soccer that day. And I thought, oh, well, that's cool. So I, I texted Kenneth Aquar. I'm like, hey, man, congratulations on the victory. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, Cameroon, they won, da, 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 right? And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, thanks. I was about to sit down and watch that at my brother's house. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sorry, man. So, so, you know, people don't necessarily watch things while they're happening now, do they? They can save them and watch them later. And we've got these great things that allow us to not have to be home on Saturday night. They're they're DVRs. And and then, of course, there's streaming services where you can just get a show. You know, it used to be you'd you'd tune into your favorite TV show, and you'd watch that episode, and it was great, and you'd have to wait a week until the next one came out, right? Do we have that anymore? No, well, it does. But, you know, the better thing to do is just to wait till the end of the season and then just watch them all at once. And then, you know, you're in there and it's like your eyes are bloodshot because you've been staring at this. This idea of streaming video that you can binge watch a program. Let's have a moment of honest confession. Who's guilty? Okay? And yet I say, I don't have time to go to church today. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read my Bible. What if we stopped binge watching and started binge reading? What if we stopped binge watching and started binge praying? What if we stopped binge watching and started binge fellowshipping or binge praying together in community? What if we made Wednesday night Bible study our version of must watch TV? I'm just saying we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. Look, I'm not trying to give anybody the guilt trip. I'm just as guilty as you are of not using my time in the best manner possible. But we are called to examine ourselves, aren't we? And maybe we need to examine how we're using our time and whether or not we're spending it on our own pleasures and our own desires Or are we spending it on the kingdom of God? Are we spending it on encouraging and building relationships in our family and between our families within the body? Are we using that time and spending it on reaching out to others in our community? How are we giving back some of what God has given to us? It's worth examining. And he says here that we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. Therefore, meaning because you're to walk uh, circumspectly, because you're not to be as fools but as wise, because you're to redeem the time because these days are evil. He says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I want to talk about that for a second in connection with what I just said. Paul is saying, do not be drunk with wine. And that is a very specific command. I'm going to tell you very bluntly, um, and not everybody will agree with what I am about to say. The Bible does not teach that it is a sin to have a drink. It does not. But it does teach that it is a sin to be drunk. So we as believers are to set aside those things and not to be drunk with wine, but rather to be filled with the Spirit. Now, some of you are sitting here today and saying, well, I don't really care to drink anyhow. I'd rather do X, Y, or Z. But here's the problem. Paul is not just talking about alcohol or about wine here. He's talking about a principle, and that is this. Do not allow anything in your life to become excessive or out of balance, but rather give yourself to the Spirit of God. So you may say, well, I'm not drunk with wine. Okay, well, are you drunk on sitcoms? 
Or are you drunk on cheeseburgers? Or are, do you understand what I'm saying? Is there anything in your life that is so predominant in your life that you're doing that thing, whatever it may be, to excess? to the point that it is taking the priority in your life over the word of God and over the things of God. Regardless of what it is, if it is excessive in your life to the point that it's crowding out the things of the Lord, then that's an idol. And we need to tear down those idols. Does that make sense? Are you hearing me, church? Okay. So, This is very practical, I understand that, but that's where we are. That's what Paul is speaking to us. He's saying, therefore, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. And that's the point, that dissipation is that anything that you're doing to excess, don't become dissipated by these things, but rather be filled with the Spirit. So how are we to to build one another up? Well, we're to do that by speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, there are lots of things that we can do to encourage one another. I know some of you have the practice of sending out encouraging verses over, over your cell phones. That's a beautiful practice. That is encouraging one another with the word of God daily or weekly or however you do that. That is one way in which we can keep this, speaking to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual psalms singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. You say, well, I can't carry a tune. Well, the song can be in your heart, amen? And if we worship the Lord in our hearts, if we worship the Lord in our spirits and in our minds, then that is going to influence and impact the way that we respond to one another and treat one another. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. This tells me that Zig Ziglar was right when he says you need to have an attitude of gratitude. And if you don't have an attitude of gratitude, then you need a checkup from the neck up. That's what Zig used to say. And the point that he's making is this. We have been blessed by God with so many spiritual blessings. He has done so much for us that anything he could ask us to do for him or for his body is nothing in comparison. And we are to develop within ourselves a thankful heart. A heart that is so overwhelmed by all that God has done that there is nothing that God could ever ask me to do that would be unreasonable or that would be too much to do for him. Amen? And so, having said all of this, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us this final caveat, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. In other words, we are to consider one another out of respect, not simply for one another, but out of respect for the Lord, right? Do you ever know a kid, maybe in school, who had a really, really tough big brother? Anybody ever know somebody like that? And people would have a tendency to want to pick on that littler kid until they found out who his big brother was. And once they realized who his big brother was, they treated that kid with a little deference or respect because you didn't want to mess with the kid because if you did, his big brother was going to break your nose. Now, we may not have known anyone like that, but we've seen enough movies to recognize that stereotype, right? Well, here's the thing. Jesus is your big brother. So when I interact with you, I need to be respectful of you, not just because of who you are, but because of who your big brother is. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you interact with other people within the body, when someone has irritated you and so you decide to gossip about them, you need to remember you, you, you are forgetting who their big brother is. So how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we encourage one another is vitally important to the Lord, because he's our big brother. 
We are part of the family of God, part of the household of the king. You are crowned princes and princesses. Do you know that? You have a royal lineage. And you need to remember that the person that's sitting next to you does too. And you need to treat that person as though they were a member of the royal family of God. Because that's what and who they are. And when we learn to treat one another in that way, suddenly this principle of submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord becomes much more practical. It becomes more doable. Now, I talked last week a bit about this idea of everybody combing their hair in different ways. You remember that? Everybody should comb their hair when they get up in the morning. You want to make it look neat and orderly, at least presentable in some way or another. I mean, nobody wants to go to work with bedhead, right? I I work in a high school, and... uh, I love Spirit Week. You know, Spirit Week's a lot of fun because they have all these different themes that they come up with. There's Pajama Day and there's there's Superhero Day and there's this day and that day and the kids all get into it and they come. I think there should be a Bedhead Day. You know, a day when you get up and you just come as you are, right? Just like whatever it is. I think that'd be crazy. It'd be fun. Bedhead day. But we don't, we, don't, we don't like to do that. It's embarrassing to have people see us with our hair going. You know, so what do we do? We comb our hair. But men and women typically do not comb their hair the same way. A woman combs her hair in a particular way. A man combs his hair in a different way. But they both comb their hair. A child gets a certain type of a haircut, perhaps. When Elisha, my youngest, when he was a kid, every year for soccer season, just before soccer started, their team was the Sharks. That was their team. And their, their, their uniforms were blue. So every year, right before soccer season, Elisha would get a blue mohawk. It was like his dorsal fin. You know, that's what it was. And so he would do that every year. Well, you know, that's great for kids, sure. I don't want to see people showing up at work with a blue mohawk. It's really not an appropriate. So a kid combs their hair in one way, but an adult combs their hair in another way. And and that is a perfect picture of what this, this, this command, submit yourselves one unto another in the fear of the Lord, it can be illustrated by because we are all to submit ourselves to one another in the fear of God But that looks different in different roles. That looks different in different lives. So when the Bible tells us here in the next few verses that wives are to submit to their husbands in all things and to show them respect, that is how a wife carries out the command in Ephesians 5.21, submit yourselves one unto another. Well, how does a husband follow the command of Ephesians 5, 21, submit yourselves one unto another with his wife. He loves her. That's how he submits himself to her. How do children carry it out? They obey their parents. How do parents carry out submitting to their children? They do not provoke them to wrath. Employers and employees, the same thing going into chapter 6. These are all demonstrations of how each one of us in our area of life, in our role in this life, is to carry out obedient behavior in response to Ephesians 5.21, submit yourselves unto the Lord. Now, I've heard a lot of pastors approach this section with fear and trepidation, you know, like, oh, ladies, you know, hey, you know, you know, the Bible says submit, but here's the thing. We don't have to look at wives, submit yourselves to your husbands and be embarrassed by it because husbands are to submit themselves to their wives too. There is an equal submission. It's just that that submission looks different in different people's lives. And so there's equality here. There's no command, ladies, that the Lord is giving you that he's not giving your husbands just as difficult a command. Let's read and see what Paul has to say here. He says in verse 22, wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands 
in everything. Submission can never be forced. Because when submission is forced, it is no longer true submission. Then it is domination and it is oppression. So men, you cannot enforce this rule. You know, you can't go home and say, woman, the Bible says you're to submit to me, so you need to submit. doesn't work like that. Right. Jesus didn't come to you and say, boy, you better believe in me, right? Because I sacrificed myself for you, so you best... No, he doesn't do that. What does he do? He invites us. He invites us into a relationship with him. And so husbands, you are to invite your wives to submit to you, not to force them to or to threaten or cajole or to try to make them or even to try to bully them with the words of scripture. That's God's job, not yours. You are to wash them with the water of the word. You're to bless them with the words of scripture. But that submission has got to take place in their heart. So husbands, you need to spend less time worrying about whether or not your wife is submitting to you and more time worrying about whether or not you are submitting to them in the fear of the Lord. You say, well, how do I do that? You do it by loving them, by putting their needs before your own, by sacrificing yourself for them just as Christ sacrificed himself for us. Christ loved us in that he sacrificed himself for us and in that he came to serve us. So husband, what does it look like to love your wife as Christ loved the church? It means you sacrifice yourself for her and you serve her. And if you are sacrificing yourself for her and if you are serving her, what do you think her natural response is going to be to that? It's going to be to show you respect. It's going to admire what you do for her. You see, these relationships that we have with one another of respect and love and love and respect are cyclical. One leads to the next. But in the same way, if we controvert these rules, if we go against them and transgress them, if instead of showing respect, the wife shows disrespect, do you think that her husband's tendency is going to be to show more or less love for her in that scenario? Less. In his book, Love and Respect, Egrich calls that the crazy cycle. And we want to stay off the crazy cycle. Okay? So, looking back at the passage here, it says that wives are to submit to their own husbands and everything. Now, going on, he says in verse 23, excuse me, verse uh, 25, husbands, Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So the marriage relationship is a picture of the relationship that Jesus Christ has with the church. The foundational principles of marriage are found in the very first chapters of the Bible, going back to Genesis chapter 3. God had created everything that was, and he said, hey, that's good. Hey, that's good. Hey, that is good. Everything that he had created, he said it was good. The first thing he said that was not good was this. It is not good that the man should be alone. 
It's not good that the man should be alone. And so he created a helpmate comparable to him. And now you got to think of it from the man's perspective here. God created the man. God gave the man a job. God walked with man in the garden. And let me tell you something. I have a feeling that the man was pretty happy with the situation just as it was. I don't think the man ever realized that there was anything in his situation that was not perfectly right. And so the Lord had to bring it to his attention. He had to illustrate for the man through a picture what it was that the man was missing. And so God got all the animals together and he brought them to the man to see what the man would call them. And as the man is seeing each of these animals, he's naming them. Apparently, Adam was the first zoologist. And he's naming the animals. And he's saying, oh, well, that is a lion. Look at that big shaggy mane. Well, there's another one just like it, but it doesn't have a mane. And it's a little smaller. We'll call that one a lioness. And and then the horse comes along, and he's like, wow, that is a horse. But wait a minute. That horse is a little different than this horse. I guess we'll call that one a stallion and we'll call that one there. We'll call that a mare. And so as he's going through, he's seeing that, that every animal had its counterpart animal, that they were male and female, but there was not one found for Adam. And so Adam, if you, if you can make a small inference here, is seeing all these things and he's like, well, there are two of those and there are two of those and there are two of those and there are two of those, so there's only one of me. And so since there wasn't a companion found for Adam, God caused a deep sleep to fall on him. And he took a rib out of his side, and out of that rib he formed a woman. Now think about this for a moment, guys. God made man out of dirt. Women, that's why we're so messy. But God made woman out of a rib. And come on, guys, is there anything better than ribs? right? I think God knew what he was doing. And so he brought the woman to the man. And that's what God does. God brings people together, doesn't he? He brought the woman to the man and the man looks at her and he says, behold, (laughs) This is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Do you know what the word in there that Adam begins with actually means? The word means at last. It means at last. At last, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, I will call her woman for she was taken out of man. And let me tell you an interesting secret here, guys. The first woman was taken out of man, but every man since has been taken out out of woman. Amen? So God creates this thing, marriage, and and he says that, listen, for this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, God told us through Paul's writing in Ephesians 5 that that relationship is a picture of the relationship between Jesus and the church. And let me show you how this works. The church, those of us who have become the church, were taken out of the world. The world, that was our mother and father. And so we have left our mother and father, we have left the world. And we are cleaving unto Christ. Just as the Husband cleaves unto his wife, and we are becoming one with Christ, just as the husband and the wife became one flesh. And God's perfect picture did not allow for divorce. In other words, those two that became one would never be separated, which was a picture of how when the church becomes one with Christ, they will never be separated from him. Amen? That's one of the reasons that God hates divorce so much is because it ruins the picture that he was trying to paint of the church's relationship to Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful relationship that is. So 
some people will look at Ephesians 5 and say, well, you know, that's really not about marriage. It's about the relationship of Christ to the church. And so Paul has to finish out with that verse where he says, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And if you need more reinforcement, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 real quickly. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. In Colossians 3.18, Paul isn't talking about a picture of Christ in the church. He's talking about how we as believers are to behave. And he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bondservants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. The woman who says, well, I don't want to respect my husband. He's not worthy of respect. Well, wait a second. Is the Lord worthy of respect? Well, yes. And the Lord considers the respect that you give to your husband as though it were respect given to him. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 18. And the husband may say, well, you don't understand what a, what, a, what a nag she is and I don't know how I can love someone who disrespects me the way that she does. Well, hold on a second. You're to do it as unto the Lord. So don't tell me you love the Lord and then not love your wife because God considers the love that you give to your wife as though it were love demonstrated for him. So whatever you do in your relationships, we, we do it as unto the Lord, you see. Now, sometimes I hear in counseling in particular, I'll hear a woman say this. I need to address this just briefly, and it falls in line with what we're talking about. But I'll hear a woman say, well, I will show him respect as soon as he shows me that he is worthy of my respect. He's got to earn my respect. Have you ever heard people say you've got to earn respect? Ever hear that? There's some truth to that. In order to be respected, you must be respectable, right? You need to live a life of honor and integrity. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. That having been said, ladies, should you have to earn his love? Well, no, he should just love me. You see, we think that respect needs to be earned, but that love needs to be unconditional, that's inconsistent thinking, friends, because both of these things are to be done in obedience to Ephesians 5.21, which is submit yourselves one unto another in the fear of the Lord. So that means if you're going to place conditions on one, then there need to be conditions on the other as well. And if one is going to be unconditional, then the other needs to be unconditional too. What that says is this, your husband may not have earned your respect, but he is worthy of your respect because he is your husband. And husbands, your wives may not have earned your love, but they are worthy of your love because they are your wife. Now here's an incredible thing that happens. When one of us acts in obedience toward this command, then the other is influenced to do so as well. And when one of us acts in disobedience to this command, then the other is influenced to act in disobedience to this command as well. The more a wife respects her husband, the more likely that husband is to show her love. And the more a husband loves his wife, the more likely that wife is to show her husband respect. You want your wife to respect you? Don't demand her respect. Love her and she'll respect you. You say, well, she doesn't respect. Well, how are you loving her? Well, I don't like the way she, well, wait a minute. Are you washing her with the water of the word? Are you praying over her? Are you loving her? And wives, the same goes for you. Why? Because we're all to encourage each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. We're all to do that. So you see, this is the same command 
that is simply obeyed in accordance with who we are in Christ. Are you hearing me, church? I want to read a quote or two to you here from a book that I have become a little bit familiar with. How many of you have ever heard of or, or possibly read the book Love and Respect by Emerson Egrich? Anybody ever read that book? It's a good book, some very good principles in here. It is based upon the principles that we're covering today. In it, Egrich says the following. In his book, Love and Respect, Egrich writes this. Your spouse can affect you, but your spouse does not control you. So that means this, if your wife, husband treats you with disrespect, that may negatively affect your desire to love her, but it does not control your ability to obey the Lord. So when she treats you with disrespect, rather than being unloving in return, try to flip that around and love her anyway in obedience to God, because she can affect you, but she doesn't control you. And in doing so, you will affect her and redirect the course of your relationship. Egrich goes on to say that when offended, husbands should act like men and be strong. And he cites 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, in which Paul writes, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, and let all that you do be done with love. Now, I'm speaking to the husbands, guys, because the bottom line is God has made you the leader in your household. God has appointed you as the leader in your family. So if this love and respect cycle is going to start somewhere, it needs to start with you. And regardless of how she has treated you, regardless of whether she deserves your loving, tender care or not, God has called you to love her. So in obedience to your king, men, do your job. Do you hear me? Do your job. Don't complain or whine or moan or groan about how she doesn't respect you or doesn't listen to you, but instead, do your job. What is your job? Your job is to love her like Christ loved the church. Do you notice that Christ will correct the church, but he loves the church even in the midst of correction? that Christ sacrifices for the church and serves the church. Now, wives, this does not let you off the hook because you are to be obedient to the Lord as well. And if your husband won't start the cycle of love and respect, then it is incumbent upon you to do so. Egrich writes this, Unfortunately, a wife's usual approach is to complain and criticize in order to motivate her husband to become more loving. This usually proves about as successful as trying to sell brass knuckles to Mother Teresa, right? If he isn't loving you the way that he should be or the way that you want him to be or the way that you need him to be, do you think that you're nagging him and complaining about it to him is going to change that? What's it going to do? It's going to push him further and further away, isn't it? Egrich doesn't leave men out either. He says this, he says, The husbands decide to motivate their wives to become more respectful by acting in unloving ways. And this usually proves about as successful as trying to sell a pickup to an Amish farmer. Those are Emerson's jokes, not mine. I need to distance myself a little from that last one. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is this, is we want love, we want respect, but we go about trying to get them in ways that are counterintuitive and counterproductive. If you want your husband to love you, don't nag him about loving you. If you want your husband to love you and to be romantic with you, don't complain that he never buys you flowers or that he never does this or he never does that. Instead, express your respect to him through your words, your actions, and your attitudes. And the result will be that his love for you will begin to grow and manifest itself in ways that you've never seen. Husbands, in the same manner, don't 
demand respect from your wives. Woman, you're to respect me, and I, dis- I don't appreciate the disrespect. And the- don't. If you treat her in an unloving way, if you're harsh with her or cruel with her or unloving toward her, do you think that's going to make her respect you more? That might make other guys respect you, but that's not going to make your wife respect you. Let me give you a hint. Your wife is not another guy in case you hadn't noticed. So don't treat her like one. She is a precious daughter of the king. You know what they call daughters of the king? What do you call a king's daughter? A princess. So guys, you need to treat her like a princess. How would you treat a princess? If you don't know, go watch some Disney movies. (laughs) I'm sorry. You know, it's a primer on how to treat princesses. You don't go in demanding their respect. That trick never works. Listen, the thing that we have to remember through all of this is that this is simply an expression of our gratitude to the king who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We love one another because Jesus Christ first loved us. Amen? And gave himself for us as a sacrifice for our sins. That means he offered us forgiveness. And I want to tell you something right now. There are some relationships out there I've talked mostly about husbands and wives today, but it applies not only to husbands and wives, but to parents and children and employers and employees. There are some relationships out there that have operated counterintuitively to these principles. So where do you start to get it right? How do you start to turn it around? Well, you start in the same place that the church starts with Jesus, and that is seeking his forgiveness. Coming to him and saying, Lord, forgive me, for my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And you know what? Maybe there are some husbands and wives out there today who need to go to one another and say, you know what? Forgive me for not showing you the respect that you deserve. And forgive me for not loving you the way that God has called me to. I want to get it right. So let's work on this together. That's where we start. And as we follow the Lord and as we operate according to the principles that he has outlined in his word, the miraculous thing is that those spiritual gifts that he has blessed us with in abundance will begin to manifest themselves in our lives and that love and respect cycle will begin to grow. And before you know it, you'll be looking back across your marriage and you'll be able to say, oh my Lord, look what you have done. Because he can create something perfect out of that which is sadly imperfect. He gives beauty for ashes. So if you're sitting in a pile of ashes in terms of your relationships with other people today, repent. Go to the Lord and seek forgiveness. Ask him to bring healing to that relationship and then go to that person and make amends. Go to that person and ask for their forgiveness and go to that person and begin to show them the love and the respect that God has called you to give them. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all for the glory of our Lord and King Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this word that you have spoken. I thank you for these things that Paul has written to us. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the desire to walk in obedience to this word. Lord, I pray for these husbands that they would truly and deeply and passionately love their wives, even as Christ loved the church. And Lord, I pray for these wives that you would help them, Lord, to not only show, but to feel and to have a reverence and respect for their husbands. 
that their husbands need just as much as they need love. Lord, help us to honor you through how we treat one another. And let us walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Heed the Word, the online Bible ministry of Calvary Chapel Southwest Metro. Calvary Chapel meets in Joshua, Texas on Sunday mornings at 10.30. Join us as we worship the Lord this week or watch online at www.ccswm.org and follow the links to our YouTube channel. Thank you and have a blessed day.